My name is Michael Manna. Uh, I just want to tell you a couple things um, about me. I, uh, I grew up in Ramsey. I went to Don Bosco High School. I went to Boston College. I was an accounting major. I graduated in 1970. I was seventh in my class. My mother was very happy. And I went to Boston College Law School and I graduated in 73. I was in the top 10%. She was happy again. Then I went to work for a certified public accounting firm, which is now called KPMG, is the third largest CPA firm in the world. I worked in the tax department doing nothing but estates and trusts. I left there and I have been practicing law uh, in New York and New Jersey for the last 46 years, 45 of which are my own practice here in Ridgewood. I only do elder law and estate planning. I teach it for the bar to other lawyers. I teach it to certified public accountants. I teach it to social workers. They're all required to have a certain amount of mandatory continuing education. I'm authorized to teach them. And I'm a member of the National Academy of Elder Law Attorneys. There's only 4,000 of us in the country. My suggestion to you is if you're going to hire anybody, you ask them, are they a member of the National Academy of Elder Law Attorneys? Uh, go on their website. It's n-a-e-l-a dot o-r-g. It's n-a-e-l-a dot o-r-g. And uh, that's their website. And um, you can find out if the guy is a member. And uh, <clears throat> I always find Googling people, for me, is uh, terrific. And, uh, and if you Google me, you'll see I have 172 positive reviews. So you know, don't hesitate to do that. The other thing is uh, my uh, website is www.law4seniors. The four is the number four, not F-O-R. And if you go there, you will, um, sorry to keep on messing around with this. Uh, you'll, you'll see uh, there's a button that says videos. If you click on that button, uh, it'll take you to a page with about a dozen videos. And uh, one of them is introduction. We'll tell you a little more detail, if you want to hear more detail, about my qualifications. And uh, there's about a dozen other that go into different topics that I think you'll find kind of interesting. Hello, how are you? Hi, how are you? Good, have a seat. Uh, what I did was I made a little handout here. Uh, it's really not, it's a little informative, not that great, but I'm going to give you all one of these. On the back is, uh, is my website address. And if you take one, pass it back, I would appreciate it. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> here are the rules. You have any questions, ask them as you have them, because they find people forget them. And... Uh, you know, we're going to go through this, and I'm going to try to uh, kind of keep it as simplified as possible. And, um, uh, you know, we're going to talk about things. So, so the first thing I, I want to tell you is, and, and this is not, a, we also teach a course, I, I teach a course here on estate planning. We're not going to go into that tonight uh, because there's really too much material to cover even for just what we're going okay. through. I'm just going to say one thing about taxes, okay? Uh, people, whenever people get ill, they get old, uh, the, the, uh, the big incentive or the big thing people do is they want to get rid of all the assets of the older person, take them out of their names. I just want you to know it could be a disastrous thing if you have assets that have gone up in value. There's something called uh, a, a step up in cost basis. Grandma bought her house back in 1960 here in Ridgewood. She paid $15,000 for it, now it's worth five hundred fifteen. dollars If grandma dies owning it <clears throat> and you inherit it, it has a, what's called a step-up cost basis to five fifteen. dollars You turn around and sell it the next day for five fifteen. dollars no capital gains tax. On the other hand, if she gives it to you, you don't get a step-up in cost basis. Now you got her house with her cost of $15,000. You turn around and sell it, uh, you're going to have a $500,000 capital gain. Capital gains is 20%. Uh, I'm sorry, 15%, but if your income's over 400000 it's 20 Plus, uh, do not forget, uh, New Jersey has gross income tax of, uh, I think it's 8.9 or 9.3, something like that. So by the time you get done, one's deductible and the other, you're talking about 25% in taxes. Uh, that's 125000 on that $500,000 house. Right about now, I get uh, the, uh, the, the, the march of the, uh, no, actually, it's not right now. It's more towards, uh, towards the middle of April, beginning of May. I get these people coming in, they're all upset. Their accountant told them they have to come up with a hundred something thousand dollars, they sold mom's house. And, and that's because they, you have to look before you leap and you have to get the right information. Same thing goes for stocks. <clears throat> Mom bought IBM 
uh, 20 years ago for $5 a share. It's worth $100 a share now. Mom owns it when she dies. You inherit it at the value on date of death, $100 a share. You only pay capital gains if you turn around and sell it for more than $100 a share. Okay, where if mom gives it to you, you got her $5 a share, and you sell it, you got to pay the capital gains. So, and there are trusts that we can do, but you say, well, you want to give it away because mom may get sick going to the nursing home, and nursing homes are between twelve and $18,000 a month now. So uh, you want to get rid of her assets, but you get rid of them through the use of trusts. There are certain kinds of trusts. They're called, I don't know if you've ever heard of them, but they're called intentionally defective grantor trusts, okay? And these can give you the best of both worlds. Mom gets rid of it, but you still get the step up in basis, okay? But you have to know what you're doing. You really have to know the income tax laws. You have to know the capital gains laws. You have to know the Medicaid laws. You have to know estates and trusts where they all kind of intersect is where you want to be so you understand. It's kind of like a ball being suspended in this room by rubber bands. You move the ball, you increase the tension on some of the rubber bands, you release, you release the tension on others. You have to understand the dynamics of what you're doing. I just want you to don't go running out because the average uh, uninformed person goes running out and wants to dump the assets and, 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 and usually give it to the kids. Okay, grandma, that's what grandma wants to do. And it could be disastrous from a tax standpoint unless you talk to somebody who, uh, who's been around the block a few times, okay? So that's, that's number one. The other thing I want to tell you is right now, <clears throat> if you're married, you can have 22 million. If you're single, you can have 11 million before you pay any federal estate taxes, okay? So 22 million is pretty good. If you're married, you've got more than 22 million, please let me know, I'd like to take you out to lunch. And uh, that tw if you're single, it's 11 million. That number is going down to about six million per person or 12 million a couple on January 1, 2026, unless the law is extended. Okay, it expires on that date. Uh, if Biden has his, has his way, at least when he was running for office, he said he wanted it to go down to eight million for a married couple, four million for a single couple. I don't see him since he, got, uh, uh, since he was elected, I haven't seen him bring that topic up again. So I don't think that that's gonna happen, but you should just, again, just know that uh, these things are in the works, okay? And, and if you're, uh, certainly if you're under 8 million, you don't have to, and, and the vast majority of us are, you don't have to worry about federal estate tax. New Jersey eliminated their estate tax uh, uh, for people dying on or after January 1, 2018. What does that mean? If you leave your spouse, your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren, your stepchildren, your wealth, no tax even if you have 100 million, okay? Now, do not forget one thing. New Jersey has a very nasty tax called inheritance tax. I don't know if anyone's ever heard of it or if it's ever bitten you. But if you leave someone other than those people, who are those people? Spouse, children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, stepchildren, and I forgot parents also. If you leave it to anyone other than those people, you have to pay New Jersey uh, uh, inheritance tax. It's called inheritance tax because it depends on who inherits. And depending on the relationship to you uh, is the rate, but I can tell you they all max out at 16%. And uh, depending on who you are, for instance, if you're a niece, a nephew, a, a friend, they, it starts at 15% from dollar one, goes up to 16%. If you're a brother or a sister, you get the first 25 grand, no tax. Then it starts at 11%, goes up to 16%. Okay, so it depends on what category you're in. Uh, you really don't want to leave, and, and in my 46 years, nobody does anyway, but you don't want to leave son-in-law's, daughter-in-law's money because they're subject to this tax. So now you have a good reason why you don't want to leave that devil in the blue dress, you know, money. So, uh, because you, you want to save the tax. You want to save, if you leave it to your child, there's no tax. If you leave it to an in-law, they're going to pay New Jersey inheritance tax. And, and, uh, even though they get the first 25,000, no tax, you still got to file the return, which means it's going to cost you another four, $4,500 maybe to have me or some accountant file it for you. So you don't, you don't want to do that. So that's all I really want to say about estate planning, okay? Uh, the other thing I want to tell you is if you go to my website and you go to the videos, there is a button that says why you should love probate, okay? I can't tell you how many people come into my office. They want a revocable living trust. Why do they want a revocable living trust? Because they want to avoid probate. Why do they want to avoid probate? They want to avoid probate so they don't 
have to pay these uh, gouging uh, attorneys who are going to rip their hearts out, legal fees, and the way they're going to do that is with a revocable living trust. Well, uh, this is usually caused by New Jerseyites uh, being um, uh, 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 snowbirds, and they go down to Florida, and I will tell you, Florida has the worst probate of any state in the country to come back with all these horror stories. But I will tell you that New Jersey is the easiest state in the country to probate a will. And uh, if you go to come to my estate planning course, uh, I will, uh, I'll tell you how that's done. Um, but it's very simple. I would say 95% of my clients do it on their own. Prior to COVID, almost all of my clients did it on their own. Now you have to have a little bit of computer savvy. So some of my older clients don't have that. So we got a few more percent doing it, but uh, there's no reason to avoid it. I can tell you that within 10 days, normally you're in the driver's seat. Pre-COVID, it was 10 days. Now it's about four to five weeks and you're in the driver's seat. And the total cost uh, for the fees to do it for, to the surrogate's office is like 200 bucks. So if you want to spend $3,500 on a revocable living trust, all it's going to save you is a trip to Hackensack and $200. It makes no sense in my mind whatsoever. It doesn't protect your assets if you get sick. It doesn't save you any taxes. All it does is avoid the probate process. Okay? So I don't want to go into what exactly that process is because it's going to consume more of our time. And, uh, but, but the other course, we'll talk about that. Okay? So you need three pieces of paper. We talked about a will. Now, what's so great about a will? Well... You have a disabled child. You have an aging mother. She's in her 90s. The last thing you want to do is leave a disabled child or an aging person money. Why? Because you're going to make them wealthier. And why don't you want to make them wealthier? Because if they get sick, and the odds of them getting sick is higher than the rest of us, they're going to go into a nursing home. And the nursing homes cost twelve dollars to $18,000 a month, even at home. <clears throat> if you go through an agency, I've seen clients paying $2,700 a week for 24-hour, seven-day-a-week care, okay? Uh, so you, they're going to spend lots and lots of money, and they're not going to be eligible for Medicaid. Medicaid is what we want everybody to get on until they have $2,000 worth of assets. So you've just made them wealthier, and now they're going to spend your inheritance. Who benefits the state of New Jersey, not mom or your, or your child? So you want, whatever you're going to leave to mom or your child, you want to leave it in something called a supplemental needs trust. It's an SNT. It's called a SNIT, okay? And that SNIT can be in your will. And so instead of leaving grandma a quarter of a million dollars, you leave a, you leave a quarter of a million dollars to grandma's SNIT, a SNIT it, which is created in your will for grandma. And by the way, in this life, there's two kinds of trusts. There are... Living trusts, living trusts are things you create while you're alive. They actually start to function while you're alive. And there are what are called testamentary trusts. These are trusts that are dwell inside your will, uh, your last will and testament. And when your will is admitted into probate, uh, these uh, trusts then get created. Okay, And I'm talking about testamentary trusts. They're trusts that are inside your will. You don't have to fool around with them, mess with them while you're alive. It's only when you're dead they get created, which is another good thing. Okay, Of course, a lot of these trusts you have to file annual income tax returns. You've you and I file 1040s, the trust has to file 1041s. So you don't really want to start it till you have to start it. But if you leave the money in a SNIT for grandma, it's not counted as grandma's asset. That's why it's called a supplemental needs trust. Uh, it's not counted as her asset. She doesn't have to spend it down. She could still get on Medicaid if she's got 2,000 of her own money. That's all she's got left. She can get on Medicaid. You can use this SNIT to pay for things Medicaid doesn't want to pay for. My mother lived to be 98. And, uh, you know, they wanted to buy our crappy pair of hearing aids. We got our $8,500 hearing aids. Uh, 11 weeks before she died, she fell out of bed. She didn't break any bones, but she was very frail. And we wanted her to have 24-hour-a-day, seven-day-a-week care. Medicaid would not pay for that. Uh, so we went out and got our own uh, caretaker to live in with her, toilet her, bathe her, feed her, dress her, uh, be her companion. Of course, it's 1000 a week. That's going back 15 years. Uh, but uh, we had plenty of money in her trust to pay for that. And then when she died, no probate, no nothing. All I had to do was write a check to my sister for 260 a check to myself from the trust. So the trust can streamline a bunch of things. And you can have that in your will. You can do that for a disabled spouse. You can do it for a disabled parent. You can do it for a disabled child. And so a will can be great. And I hate, not hate, but I dislike when people have bank accounts and they've named beneficiaries of them. Why do I hate that? Because what happens if that beneficiary isn't alive? Who gets that money? I don't know. Sometimes it's, it's spelled out in the bank's 
form that you filled out that you may not even know. Uh, you make it payable to a child. The kid's under 18. In this country, you're not an adult until you're 18, which is a scary thought. In my mind, an 18-year-old running around with a large sum of money, where you could leave it in what I call a minor's trust in your will. And I put them in virtually every will I make, no matter how old you are, no matter how old your children are. I put in a clause that says if anybody's under 25, they don't get it outright, goes in a trust. Uncle Harry's going to be the trustee. He's going to invest the money, and he's going to pay, use it for your health, education, living expenses. <clears throat> when you turn 25, whatever's left, you get outright. Now you say, why do I need that? I have 50-year-old kids. Well, if one of your kids predeceases you, his share is probably going to go to his children. They may be minors. So all it takes up is a half a page, maybe a page in your will. You know, people go, well, I want it simple. Simple is code for cheap, okay? And, uh, and cheap may be fine, but it may not be the best thing, okay? What you want is right, okay? And, uh, and so you want trust. You could put these trusts in the wills. Trust can save taxes. They can save, they can save people from going, you know, using it up on Medicaid. They can, they can do it for minor children. There are lots and lots of trusts you can use in wills. So you want to have a will. Hello, how are you? I think you're going to have to sit on someone's lap. No, you can sit here. Have a seat. You have an extra one? Oh, oh, he's got to sign that. Oh, yes, OK. Yeah, could you just tick your name off on here? And I have a handout for you. There you are. Um, so, so a will, we, we want to make sure we got a good will, OK? The most important piece of paper, however, is not a will. It is a financial power of attorney. I like what are called general durable powers of attorney. What durable means is that most power, unless you put language in, most powers of attorney cease to function when you become incompetent, which is the whole reason why you did it. So you want to make sure it's durable, that it stays in effect even if you become incompetent. A general power of attorney the person can use it the minute you sign it. A springing power of attorney, on the other hand, they can only use it if you're cuckoo. This creates a barrier. Now they've got to go prove you're cuckoo. Uh, you don't, and I say to people, why do you want to do that? Just make it, you want to make it as simple for your daughter to pay your bills as possible. Just sign it. Tomorrow she can start paying it. You, you know, she doesn't have to prove to anybody you did anything. Well, I'm afraid she might take advantage of me. Well. If you have a springing power of attorney, she'll wait till you're sick and then take advantage of you. So what you want to do is choose the right person, not limit what they can do. Okay? And, and I'm going to tell you something that 95% of the lawyers uh, that I I, I don't know in New Jersey, and I know they don't know because I teach them, okay? and that is there are certain things you cannot do with a power of attorney unless it is specifically authorized in the power of attorney. So if your power of attorney says, I give you the power to do everything, you do not do everything. There are certain things you cannot do. They're called hot powers, OK? You cannot exercise a hot power unless it's in the, your, your power of attorney. What is the most, in hot, the most important hot power? Giving away your assets. We want to make sure, and the first thing I do when people come in is I ask them, do you have a power of attorney? 80% do not. Of the 20% who do, I say, may I see it? The first thing I'm looking for is, if, is there a gifting provision in that, and I would say 95% of them either have none or have some kind of a crippling gifting provision, like you can only give away 10000 a year, you can only give it away to charities, you can only give it away consistent with my past practices. Well, this guy never gave away anything, you know. So you want to make sure you have one that says you can give away as much as you want to whoever you want, including yourself, and you encourage people to do that if it's going to save taxes or, uh, you know, uh, make you eligible for government programs for your care earlier. Okay, and that's the first, and, and of all the papers, we can correct everything if we have that right paper. But the problem is if you don't have the right paper, and now mom is cuckoo, she cannot sign a new one unless she's competent. Okay, so now I can't have it corrected. So now what do I have to do? I have to go to court to get court permission to, to have her declared incompetent, have one of the kids appointed her guardian, and, they, and you cannot make gifts of an incompetent person without getting court permission to do that. So now I have to go to court and get court permission. All of this you should be thinking, cha-ching, 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 this is going to cost lots of money, OK? So you want to make sure you have your ducks all in a row. Uh, and, and the most important duck is, is a financial power of attorney. The third piece of paper 
is a living will medical power of attorney, advanced directive, medical proxy, whatever you want to call it. This is who's going to make your medical decisions for you. You can get them free at AARP. You can get them at uh, any hospital. We do them for nothing if we're doing your other papers. And um, you may, you know, you, 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 <clears throat> I, I will tell you this. I have people fuss over the language. The typical one says, if you're terminally ill or you're permanently unconscious, are you in a permanent degenerative state? You have an illness that's permanently degenerative, no likelihood of recovery, uh, and you cannot make your own decisions. If you're on life support, you want to be removed. If you're not on it, you don't want to be put on it. And you say whether or not you want to give away body parts, stuff like that. Okay, that's the typical one that I would say virtually everybody uh, chooses, but you can change it if you want. Okay, I will tell you this. I've been doing this 46 years. I have never seen someone who wanted their spouse's plug pulled who didn't get it pulled. And I've never seen someone who wanted them to stay on, not have them stay on. I think, I think the hospitals are more concerned about getting sued than anything else and, and getting paid. Those are the two big concerns they have. Okay, so, uh, you know, but you want to make sure you have this because you can only appoint one person at a time. And if you have two kids or somebody who is, who they fight, the one wants you to pull the plug, one doesn't. If you have a, uh, a, 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 a medical, I call it a medical power of attorney, uh, th that person is a slam dunk is going to make your decision. For you. And then you could say, you know, if that person is unavailable, who the alternate would be and who that alternate would be, you know, first, so first Mo, then Larry, then Curly kind of thing. So you, you, but those are the three basic documents that you want to have. Okay, does anybody have any questions about this? Okay, all right, so uh, let's talk about, about uh, care as you get older. Okay, what are the options? The options are in-home care. Yes, sir. go right ahead. Fill what out? Are you tell you hold on to all the papers? Yes. And by the way, I do not. A lot of lawyers like to hold on to your will and your power of attorney, the papers they prepared for you. And I think the reason why they want to hold on to the the original is the only thing that counts. If you cannot find the original, it's presumed you destroyed it because you didn't want it anymore. Okay. So photocopies, you can have them up the wazoo. They don't count. You need the original. Okay. A lot of lawyers like to keep the original for you. I think they think they keep you from misplacing it. And I think for the most part, they do keep you from misplacing it. But I find lawyers misplaced. Lawyers die, lawyers retire, lawyer, law firms break up. Nobody knows where you, your stuff went. So I always tell the clients, you keep them and make sure you always keep track of where those originals are. Okay. So when you're in that situation, you pull yours out and bring it to the hospital. Right, right. And the other thing I want to tell you is never take the staples out. I had a case once with, a, with, with someone accused my client of swapping pages. I had to get a forensic paper expert, $30,000, to prove they didn't swap pages. So if you're going to make copies of the original, when you come to my office, we make you, uh, we give you an original and a photocopy. I don't care what you do with the photocopy. You take the staples out, put it through a, a document feeder. But if you're going to make copies from the originals, you want to fold the pages back. Don't take the staples out. Okay? Microscopically, they can tell you whether or not it's been... Uh, uh, you know, fumbled with. Okay, so um, so so now, what what kind of care do people need? You know, uh, it, may, it may be in home care. Uh, like I said, uh, some people a certain number of hours a week. Uh, sometimes it's twenty four hours a day, seven days a week. I don't know if Grandpa weighs three hundred pounds. How are you going to get him back and forth to to bathe him, to toilet him, if you if you unless you hire. Uh, someone also to come by every day who's, you know, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger to help him uh, do what he's got to do. Um, uh, most people, I will tell you this, and, and I don't blame anybody, most people um, want to stay home. Nobody wants change, okay, especially as you grow older. Everybody wants to stay in their house. I would rather stay in my house. I told my wife I, I, I would like to have, uh, you know, a 24-hour day, seven day a week caretaker, preferably a 26-year-old, the French maid outfit. <laughs> but my wife said she thought it'd be difficult to get a man to wear a French maid. I said, no, no, not a man, a woman. But I don't think I'm going to get that. But in any event, I would rather be in my house, OK? Uh, the other option is assisted living. My mother was in assisted living. She kind of loved it, hated it. She, had, she would go through phases. Uh, she was there nine years. And I'll tell you about her story a little later on. But uh, <clears throat> that's, that's one option. I have seen people in assisted living 
that, depending on how much assistance they're getting, are paying as much, if not more, than you're in a nursing home. They will kind of nickel and dime you on everything. You know, you want somebody to give you your medicine, it's so much each time you have to go in there. You want somebody to do your laundry, it's so much to do the laundry. You know, uh, all kinds of little additional charges. Uh, the, the, and then, of course, there's nursing home, which is probably the most expensive. Your world is now reduced to a room. Medicaid only pays for double occupancy, which is one of the reasons why I like the Jewish Center in Rockley. The Jewish Center in Rockley, in my opinion, is one of the best places in northern New Jersey. I have a lot of Christians at the Jewish Center. I have a lot of Jewish clients at the Christian Healthcare Center in Wyckoff. But the thing I like about the Jewish Center in, 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 in Rockley, first of all, it's a monument to granite. The food is good, the care is excellent, but they only have single rooms. So when you go on Medicaid, you keep your single room. And I don't know about you, but I really don't want some stranger in a corner, you know, moaning away all day long. It'd be nice if I had a single room. So that's one of the reasons why I like it. But the other places you can pay, even if the client's on Medicaid, you can pay an upgrade fee to upgrade them to a single room. Um, however, it's kind of like the Wild West as to how much they want to charge you for the upgrade fee. Uh, what, what, what Medicaid recommends but doesn't enforce is that the difference between retail, what someone would pay for double occupancy, and retail, what someone would pay for single occupancy, the difference is how much you should pay as the, uh, as the upgrade fee. But I've had people, I've had, I've had facilities want to charge whatever Medicaid charges, the difference between that and what the room would send, sell out to a private patient without Medicaid, now we're talking three, $4,000 more, maybe $5,000 more a month, rather than 1100 or something like that. So, so you have to be kind of careful. You have to scout these things out. Nobody knows this, but I'm going to tell you this. Moses, when he came down from Mount Sinai, he had two tablets that had the, that had the Ten Commandments. But no one knows he had a third tablet. And that third tablet has the, the commandments for elder law planning. And they were chipped right into that thing. Okay, But nobody seems to know it. But I'm going to key you in. There's two key commandments. Number one. Never, ever, 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 never tell the facilities, the social, the social worker at the hospital, never tell them what mom's assets are. Never. You don't know. Mom is very secretive. You're going to go see her accountant. you get back to them later with, with that. You don't know. Okay? And the other commandment is never, ever, ever sign anything. Nothing unless you make sure you have your lawyer who is experienced in this area, review. They usually want you to sign something called an admissions agreement. You may inadvertently make yourself personally responsible for the cost of the patient's care. They cannot, uh, they cannot require that you do it, but you, if you signed it, you may inadvertently do it. Now you're in the soup. So you must remember those two things. I, I don't know where the tablet is at this point, but, but just keep that in mind. Very, very, very important. You don't know what your mother's assets are. You don't know what the patient's assets are. You'll have to get back to them. Okay? Okay, so now, uh, now what happens? Now, now mom needs care, okay? And uh, you have I to start... Have a question? Yeah. What if they say to you, uh, well, we're not admitting you unless you sign? Well, we'll get to that. But usually, once mom is there, now they have the hot potato. They cannot make what's called an unsafe discharge. It is illegal to do that. So many times, especially if they have a bunch of empty beds, they'll take you in. They'll worry about the details later. Okay. But also the nursing at uh, the hospital, when you're in the hospital, they want to get you out. They want to help place you. So they want to know how much money you have so they can entice different nursing homes to take you. We don't want that because we don't want to give them an idea of how much they're going to make before you're going to go on Medicaid. Because when you go on Medicaid, they make less money. Okay. So, you know, a nursing home, uh, you know, may, may make $12,000 a month, $15,000 on a private pay patient. But when that patient goes on Medicaid, they may only get $8,500. Now, if you're in that nursing home, do you want a, do you want a $15,000 patient or do you want an $8,500 patient? Obviously, you want a $15,000 patient. So you're going to give preference to that person. Unless you've got a bunch. It's like handling for a used car. If you have a bunch of empty, empty beds, you can, you, can, you can bargain away. Yeah. Less than 2000 Okay, so that means that, say, I have to give away my assets before uh, I can join uh, Medicaid. Uh, 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 
give away, we're going to get back to. Medicaid punishes you if you give away your assets. We didn't get to that yet. Yes? Right. 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 They won't even take you unless you have two Well, you know what? That depends. Everything depends. Okay. My partner, her name is Marie's Helmy. She was going to come tonight to speak, but she said people get upset. They expect to see me rather than her. But I'd like her to be here because I'm 74, and she's 35, and she's going to take over my practice. And I taught her everything. She's been with me 17 years. But she does all the placements in her office. She does more places than a lot of social workers at Valley. And because of that, she knows all the admissions directors. She knows which places are good, which places are bad, what you need to get in. But here's, here's the thing. How do you pay for the care? Okay. Number one, you pay if you have long-term care insurance. Now, I'm going to tell you my experience with long-term care insurance companies. 20 years ago, they were falling all over themselves in... Uh, in, in uh, uh, premium wars to see who's the cheapest to get the business. Nobody thought they were ever going to pay out on claims. Okay, now they're hemorrhaging with claims, and most of uh, all the big companies. There's only one company left. I forget the name of the company. My wife has it. I, have my, I forget the name of the company, but they they have, um, uh, uh, but Chubb and uh, uh, MetLife and all those. They don't even sell it anymore, huh? Genworth. Genworth is the only company that sells traditional long-term care insurance. Okay. Now, the other companies are pu pulling out, but they can't give their business away because it's all losing business, so they have to ride it out. So what do they do? They call you up, and they say, you know, we're raising your premium. There's nothing that keeps them from not raising the premium. They call you up. Now, after you've paid your premiums for 25 years, they call you up, and they say, we're raising your premium next year. 25%. Do you want to cancel your policy? Do you want to cut back your benefits? You should tell them where they should go put that. Okay? And, and, and they do charge. Then they do raise you 25. And then they'll call you a year or two later and say, we're raising it another 25. And they're, 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 kind of, they're kind of a bunch of whores. That's all I can tell you in that they want to get all your money. They don't want to pay out any claims, which is typical of most insurance companies about anything. Okay, but, but it's very, I think, nefarious. It's something I found really offensive when you've been paying your, your, your premiums forever, and now they, they just want to abuse you financially to get the hell out. And you'd be crazy if you would, if you would do that, okay? I paid 25 years premiums, my husband and I, uh -huh. and we're exactly in the situation you're mentioning now. Up, 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 up. It's like again, again, again. Right, 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 right. And now you've invested all this money after all these years. You got to hang in there because unfortunately there is no, nothing that guarantees that they can't raise the policy. They can't raise your policy, but everybody, they change the contract every year, but they can raise that everybody who bought that contract, they can raise. So, so you have to keep that in the back of your head. And then you look at how much, as you said, it costs for one month in a nursing home, and then you look at the annual premium and say, geez, you still really need it. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. They wouldn't, by the way, they wouldn't sell me. They tell my wife, health insurance because their health is perfect. They wouldn't sell me because I get migraine headaches. They said there were seizures. And uh, they said, you know, we're not going to issue you a policy because I get migraine headaches. So, you know, what are you going to do? So, so, so who pays for your care? Number one, you can have uh, long-term care insurance. Long-term care insurance, you have to be very careful. A couple of things. Some of them only pay for home care. Some of them only pay for assisted living. Some of them only pay for nursing home. Some of them pay for everything. Okay, there are what are called activities of daily living, ADLs. Okay, these things are like toileting yourself, bathing yourself, feeding yourself, taking your medications, transferring, getting from one chair to the other. And there's a sixth one, which I have to confess to you, I don't remember what it is. Okay, you have to be on the better policies, you have to be unable to do two of those without assistance. On the crummier policies, you have to be able to not do three of them without assistance assistance okay so these are kind of things you want to look when you buy these policies most of the people in here uh, well except for one guy here uh, well maybe everybody I don't know but 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 once you get 
above, you get into your 60s, your seven, you know, I have one lady, 70, perfect health. They would only send her, sell her a $100 a day policy, which has a 100-day exclusion. You're going to pay for the first 100 days yourself and would only go out three years. So it really doesn't go out three years. It goes out two, two and three-quarter years. And they want to charge her $8,700 a month. I mean, not a month, a year, premium, I'm sorry. So, so you know, <clears throat> it's usually, <clears throat> you have to have perfect health. So, but if you have it, it can, pay, it can be wonderful to pay for home care, assisted living, nursing home, okay? Uh, <clears throat> they will send out doctors, they will send them out, they'll send out nurses, they'll send them out periodically to check. And of course, grandma's trying to show everybody she's good. You don't want her to do that. You want, you want to do just the opposite, okay? So, uh, so uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> that's one of, the th one of the ways. The other thing is Medicare. Now, Medicare, you don't have to be poor. Medicare is not what's called needs-based, okay? Medicare, uh, oh, you have to be a 65 or older. Uh, I think you have to be a U.S. citizen for five years to get Medicare. Uh, you have to have worked 40 quarters, I think, or be disabled, something along those lines. But uh, <clears throat> I'm not an expert on Medicare, but I will tell you, Medicare will pay for 100 days, up to 100 days of nursing home. It'll pay for 100% of the first 20 days, and it'll pay for 80% of the next 80 days. And if you have uh, supplemental insurance, like AARP or, or uh, you know, Blue Cross Blue Shield, something like that, that'll pay the 20% that Medicare doesn't pay, as long as Medi Medicare's paying the 80%. Now, they will only pay this under two circumstances. Number one, you have to be in a hospital Admitted, not for observation, for at least three midnights. And then you have to be transferred within 30 days of that admission to a facility because you either need rehabilitation, which you had a stroke, you've got to, have to learn how to walk again, or you need uh, 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 skilled medical care at least once a day. Uh, what's that? You're on a machine, you've got tubes in you, you need injections, stuff like that. I will tell you that most nursing homes are very generous with the first 20 days and very stingy with the last 80 days. And uh, most of the rehab patients, almost none of them ever reach the 100 days because once you plateau, once you're not getting better anymore, they say you're no longer skillable and they don't want to pay. And I would say that probably 70% run out right at 20 days or shortly thereafter and the other 30% run out somewhere in the next 30 days, okay? Um, you can appeal it. We don't get involved in the appeals to pay us. Wouldn't make a whole lot of sense, but you need medical expert to say the person still needs to have it, okay? And uh, so, so that's, that's what. Uh, skilled nursing care, on the other hand, usually you have an illness that's gonna last a long time. You know, maybe you have, uh, you're, you, you're on a trach, you have, uh, uh, you, you know, intravenous, you need IVs, you, you know, you, uh, usually those people make the 100 days. You have a wound that needs to be uh, attended to. And by the way, and this is the key to the world of elder law planning, nursing homes will bend over backwards to get a Medicare patient. Why? Because they make tons of money per day on a Medicaid patient. Med I'm sorry, Medicare patient, Medicare patient, not Medicaid, Medicare, okay? So I always tell my clients, when grandma's in the hospital, I said, you better be prepared because in, in tomorrow or the next day, they're going to say, they're shipping mom out. And they're shipping her to someplace to get, to get, uh, to get uh, you know, a rehab, okay? And I said, and you got to be prepared before that happens because you, want, number one, want to check the facility out, and number two, you want to make sure that when Medicare runs out, they will take mom as a long-term Medicaid patient. The dirty little secret is nobody wants a Medicaid patient because they make less money on a Medicaid patient, but everybody wants a Medicare patient. So you have to use Medicare as bait to get them into where you want to go. And I have gotten people in with no money in on Medicare, and then after that they take them, sometimes a month or two or three, but once they take them, they can't just throw them out when it's over. They're stuck with them. They have to put them somewhere, okay? Maybe they have another facility, you know, uh, Care One has facilities all over the place. They may put them in a facility they don't like, but they can't get rid of them.
okay? And, uh, and you know, this is something you have to know, okay? And, and they may tell you, well, you need at least this much for us to take. They're in there. They're in there. Mike Manna says you cannot make an unsafe discharge. Let's talk about this, okay? That's what you got to do. All right? Yes? So you're saying Medicare pays for the 100 days, first 100 days, right? No, I, I said up to 100 days is what I said. And after 100 days, your, your point is you have to, if the person cannot leave, yeah. you're saying that they have to keep the patient. Correct. That is correct, 100% correct. And it just charges battery. I don't know what the hell happened here. Yeah. Yeah, well, the reason for that is because they're hoping you're going to get Medicare. Well, that's what I was yeah. Yes, correct. That's right. That's right. Correct. And what you want to do is you want to apply for Medicare, I mean Medicaid, while they're still getting Medicare. So that when it runs, so you have a seamless coverage. Okay. And what you want to do is you don't want to do it yourself. You don't want it. You do not want to do it yourself. Can you do what? Ah, well, that's the whole trick, okay? That's the trick. And we're going to talk about some tricks. And I'm going to tell you that you never, I hate to say never and always, but I'm going to say it. You never have to spend all your money. I don't care if you're already in a nursing home, you have money left. You can always save money, okay? Always. Obviously, the sooner you do something, the more money you can save, but you can always save money, always, okay? Are you talking about bargaining? No, 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 no. I'm talking about the Medicaid laws. Okay, I mean, There's about five or six tools in the Medicaid laws that can save you money. Typically, we'll, go, we'll talk, I just don't want to jump ahead of myself. So, so I've just covered Medicare, okay? Medicare is the bait, okay? And of course, then you will privately pay until you are eligible for Medicaid. And you will not be eligible if you are a single person for Medicaid until you have $2,000. Now, if you give away money, Medicaid will punish you. When you go to apply, they have what's called a five-year look back, okay? Well, this is going to be a chewed up thing here. Okay, they have a five-year look back. And what they're going to do is they're going to want to see all the patients... Um, Financial records for the last five years. They're looking for large withdrawals, typically $2,000 or more, unless they see a pattern. But they can go up to 10 cents, okay? And they want to know where... What number are they looking for? 2000 or more, typically, okay? But they can go down. If they see 900, 900, 900, 900, they can look, okay? And what they're looking for is unexplained withdrawals. And if you cannot explain where that money went, they will assume, it's presumed to be a gift, and they will assess a penalty, okay? Now, they go back, and they look at all your five years, and, of course, you know, what we do is we look at all your five years first because if there's any warts or there's anything that we want to know before we make your Medicaid application for you. They add it all up, and they divide by $10,700 about. They may have just raised it, but it, it was $10,700. And for every time $10,700 goes into what you gave away, they will not pay for one month of your care for the next five years. Okay? So I give you $30,200, uh, 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 I'm sorry, $32,100. You divide that by 10,700, it's three. Okay? I give you $32,100. I like you. I give it to you. Okay, you're my, you're, you're my grandson. I want you to go to college. Here it is. Or you're my church. I want you to have it. Churches are not exempt from gifts. Okay. Now, four years later, I have a stroke. I don't have a dime in my pocket. So what has to happen? First, I have to be sick enough. It's called, I have to pass the pass. What is the pass? P-A-S. It's pre-admission screening. I got to be sick enough. And of course, I have to be unable to do two to three of those activities of daily living. And during COVID, they were just doing it via Zoom interviews. They weren't coming out to see you. And, uh, and you, they were presuming you were eligible medically. 
uh, unless they found otherwise. Now, I don't know. I don't do them in the office. I don't know if they have, uh, they actually come and see you or not. I, I know your doctor can give you a pass, okay? But you have to, have, you have to pass the pass. That's number one. So, so I'm in a coma, so I'm sick enough, okay? You have to be poor enough. I only got 10 cents in my pocket, so I got less than $2,000, so I'm poor enough. And then you can say, oh, manna, what'd you do over the last five years? Oh, we see four years ago, you gave away $32,100. Well, we were going to start paying for you on, on April 1st. But now we're not going to start paying until July 1st because you gave away that money. And we don't care who pays for your nursing home. We don't care if they put you out on the street. We are not going to pay for the next three months. So every time you give away $10,700, it's going to cost you fifteen grand at the nursing home. It doesn't make sense to do it. So the key is to minimize, get this person poor without, um, without incurring the penalties. And there are two really, 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 really good things. And if you go to my website, you'll see the two things. One of them is called half loaf annuity planning. And the other one is called, you guessed it, whole loaf annuity planning. Now, let me give you an example. We have a client. First of all, in order to be Medicaid eligible, the healthy spouse can keep the home as long as it is their primary residence. It can be a $10 million house. Medicaid doesn't care. As long as it's occupied by the healthy spouse as their primary residence, it is what's called an exempt resource. They will not lean it. They will not uh, uh, force you to sell it. It doesn't exist. So the last thing you want to do if dad's in a nursing home and mom's at home is sell the house because you've got this great, this great thing to shield the, what that house is worth, the, 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 the equity in that house. So, so the last thing you want to do is, is not sell the house. So mom, mom stays in the house. Dad can have only $2,000. Mom can keep one half. And by the way, they don't care in whose name the assets are, whether in dad's name or mom's name. They treat you like you're one person. Okay? And because of that, they don't care if you give money back and forth between husband and wife. No penalty for that because they treat you like you're one person. And, you know, I have mom come in and she said, oh, dad got... I, you know, he got diagnosed with Alzheimer's eight years ago, so I put everything in my name. So what? Doesn't help, okay? Now, uh, it, it does in one circumstance, but that's only if mom dies and she has the right kind of will disinheriting dad. But, but um, let's not go there right now. Mom can keep one half of their, their total wealth. So I have, a, I, have a, I have a couple, this fictitious couple. They have $332,000. Okay, and so dad can keep two, and the most mom could keep, and again, don't hold me to this number. This brings it down to 330. The most mom can keep is 130,000, and they change it periodically. It was 125, I believe it's 130 or a little over, it might be 132. For tonight, let's say it's 130. It's called the spousal resource allowance, okay? So she could keep 130,000, that's the maximum. And what it is is half of their assets, but not that half cannot exceed 130,000. And by the way, IRAs, 401ks, they're all in. Okay, whether they're moms, whether they're dads, they're in. So this couple has cash. This is an easy case. So, so dad keeps that, right? Mom keeps this. Now we're left with 200,000 that we have to spend down. Now you let the nursing home make your Medicaid application for you, you will spend it down, okay? They will take it all, okay? But what are you going to do? Well, there's two things I want you to know, and that is the, the healthy spouse's income is irrelevant to the sick spouse's application for Medicaid, irrelevant. So what mom is going to do is she's going to go out and she's going to buy what is called a short-term immediate annuity. Now, what the hell is that? Okay. Okay. So what is that? Okay. So here's what it is. And by the way, there's only two insurance companies in the entire country that will sell you a short-term annuity. Why? MetLife, Chubb, they want to sell you an annuity, but they want you to keep it forever. In fact, if you take it out, some of them in less than 10 years, there's penalties for taking it out. We don't want that. We want 
to get the money back quick. And there's only two companies in the entire country that will do short-term immediate annuities. So what does that mean? I go up to the, I go up to, the, uh, the, to the annuity company and I say, here's 200 grand. That's mom's money. First, we transferred all the money to mom. Here's 200 grand of mom's money. We want to buy an annuity that's going to pay us back 20,000 a month for 10 months. Okay? Now, we have to pay the annuity company maybe three or four or five thousand dollars because that's where they make their money. They're not making their money on investing your money. Okay? So they now give it to you. Now, what has mom done? She has transformed this $200,000 from an asset to income. Income of $20,000 a month. And we had to fight hard, I have to tell you. Uh, the elder law bar, not me in particular, but the elder law bar had to sue, and, uh, sue, sue uh, Medicaid and it went to the Supreme Court in New Jersey and they said, this is good. This is good. Okay? So mom goes out and she buys that $200,000 annuity. Now what has she done? She's transformed an asset to income and the income of the healthy spouse is irrelevant to the, uh, to the uh, eligibility of the patient. Now we make that, that that for, and by the way, you have to be eligible for Medicaid on the first day of a given month. And uh, <clears throat> so we make sure that on the first day of a given month, dad's got to have less than 2,000, mom's got to have less than 130, and we file, okay? Now, mom starts, uh, uh, that's on that day, mom starts getting her money back, okay? And within a year, she gets it all back. I've done this for people with lots and lots and lots of money, okay? And, uh, and, uh, and dad's on Medicaid. Now, once dad is on Medicaid, and by the way, if dad's in a nursing home, the minute you apply for Medicaid, you don't pay the nursing home anymore. If it takes three months, six months for them to pass on the application, it is retroactive to the day of application, and the, and the nursing home gets all the back money. You don't pay anymore once you've applied, okay? So now mom gets her money back. Dad's on Medicaid. We got him in. We got him in. We saved everything. The problem gets complicated if mom and dad have a vacation house. In addition, they got a house down the shore. They got a bunch of stocks. I got one guy now, he's got three stocks he bought over 40 years ago. They're worth a million and a half dollars. Now his cost is like zero. You, can't buy a, you cannot buy an annuity with stock. You have to sell it and convert it to cash, pay the capital gains. He's probably gonna pay three, four hundred thousand dollars worth of capital gains. So now he's gotta think, how long is mom gonna live? Is it worth walking through all that fire? Because if I do this and mom dies the next month, I just pour $350,000 down the toilet. But that's not my decision, it's your decision. Okay, so that's, yes. What I, what no, 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 an IRA is just like any other asset. It gets yeah. factored into this 130. So even though the taxes have been paid on it, it doesn't matter? Doesn't matter. They don't care what fire you have to walk through. They don't care what you have to pay. They don't care what you have to do. You have to first pay before you're eligible for Medicaid. Now, if the patient has a $100,000 IRA, he can only have assets of one two thousand. We've got to cash that in. And pay the taxes. And pay the taxes on it. And give it to mom and have her go buy an annuity. Got it. You know? Okay. Now, the other thing I want to tell you is when, when dad's in a nursing home, if you're paying, if you have to pay for some period of time, um, you want to use the IRA money. You don't want to use the cash in the bank because when dad dies, the kids are going to inherit the IRA. They're going to have to pay income tax on it. Where if you use the IRA up to pay for the nursing home, you get a medical deduction for what you pay the nursing home. Is going to, and and this, is, this is taxable income, but the medical deduction is going to offset most, if not all, of the tax for pulling the IRA out. And so it's, it's, if you got it, you'd have, maybe have to pay 40% 40, 40 in taxes between federal and state. So it's like paying mom's or dad's medical expenses with 60 cent dollars. So the knee jerk thing is always use up the cash first, the IRS last, usually. And again, these are just, I'm, I'm, I'm just making generalizations, usually you want to use up the IRA money first. And you, want, you need a good accountant uh, to, 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 to pace it out how we're going to do this, okay? So that, that's the, that's the whole loaf, okay? Now, what the heck is a half loaf? The half loaf is for a single person, okay? 
So now, how, what do we do with a half loaf? Well, I'm going to make another uh, uh, simple example. And again, this is up on my website. You can look it up, half loaf. We got a client with $100,000. Now, for purposes uh, in assets, OK? Now, for purposes of our discussion here today, he's got no monthly income. I just don't want to mess up the numbers. He's got no, no pension, no Social Security. All he's got is 100000 And let's assume, even though the actual number is 10700 or thereabouts, that every time you give away 10000 the nursing home's not, I mean, Medicaid's not going to pay for one month. Are we talking Medicaid or Medicare? Medicaid. Medicaid. Medicaid, Medicare doesn't matter. They pay or they don't. Oh. You don't have to be poor. OK, so we got a guy with 100 grand. He's in a nursing home that costs $10,000 a month. And every time you give away 10,000, uh, Medicaid's not going to pay for one month of your care. So what does he do? He goes and he gives Sonny Boy $50,000. Now, you cannot apply for Medicaid until you have less than $2,000. So what does he do with the other 50? He goes out, you guessed it, he buys a short-term annuity short-term annuity, okay? And that annuity is going to pay back 10 grand a month for five months, five months. Okay, everybody with me? So now we apply for Medicaid. Medicaid goes, what we're looking for is what's called a but-for denial. That means everything's in order, except we saw you gave Junior 50,000. And because we saw you give Junior 50,000, we are going to issue a five-month penalty period. Now, who is going to pay for dad's nursing home for those five months? This annuity is going to pay back $10,000 a month for five months. When the five months are up, the annuity has fully paid back. The five-month penalty period is up. Dad is on Medicaid. Junior has fifty grand in his pocket. Okay? Now, there are other things, and I don't want to get bogged down because we're kind of getting close to the end here, and I see a couple of people falling asleep here. Uh, but... Uh, there's something called the child caretaker exception. You have a child who lives in the house and for two years has been taking care of mom. And without mom's care, the mom would have been on Medicaid two years earlier. Mom can give the house to the child, no penalty, OK? There is the sibling exception. You have two brothers living in the house. They have both owned it and lived in it for at least a year. One brother can give the other brother his share, no penalty. There are other things we can do. Now, I just want to tell you briefly what I did with my mother. My mother lived to be 98. God rest her soul, she died eight years ago. She walked three miles a day until she was 95, which is probably why she lived to be 98. And my mom had a half a million dollars worth of assets. So when she was 79, I said to her, Ma, I want you to give Joanne and I all your money. I have one sister, her name's Joanne, and I trust her holding my wallet. And my mother said, yeah, you know, and we both have a great relationship with my mother. My mother said, why do you want me to give you and Joanne all my money? I said, I want you to give us all your money because as you, I don't want it to go up in smoke and health care costs as you get older. So my mother said, well, I have one rule. And I said, what's the rule? She said, I never, ever, ever want to have to ask your wife or my son-in-law for my money. So I was afraid if she gave a quarter of a million to me and a quarter of a million to my sister, G. What would happen if my sister died before my mother? I will tell you, my sister is five years older than me. She's had both breast and lung cancer. So it's not out of the question she could die before my mother. Now I've got to deal with my brother-in-law. Don't get me wrong. He's a wonderful guy. I'm sure he'll give me no trouble whatsoever. Okay? But it's not his mother, not his money, not his business. He is not a member of the tribe. Okay? I was also, I was also concerned. Um, what happens if my, daughter, uh, my sister gets divorced? She gets sued. She goes bankrupt. She gets sick. She spends it on something stupid, or I do those things, could jeopardize my mother's money. So instead, I created an irrevocable trust, irrevocable, living trust that's going to start functioning while we're alive, okay? I had mom. She is the grantor. She's the creator of the trust. Irrevocable. She cannot undo it. My sister and I could beat it, but not my mother, okay? And my mother gives her money to this trust, okay, this half a million. Now, What's so great about that? I don't own it. My sister doesn't own it. The trust owns it. And because the trust owns it, it doesn't matter what happens to me. I could die, get sued, go bankrupt, get sick. It's not my money. It's a tr get divorced. It's not my money. It's the trust money. Okay, so that's a great thing, right? So the trust has the money. And uh, the trust says my mother's entitled to nothing 
Because if she was entitled to anything, Medicaid would say, go get it and spend it before we're going to pay. So the trust says my mother is entitled to nothing. The only people the trustees can pay it out to are my sister and I. So my mother had to take a leap of faith that my sister and I were not going to drain the trust to take off with it because we could do that legally. There's nothing she could do about it. But she knew us. She knew that that wasn't going to be an issue. And so that wasn't a problem. So she gives her money to the trust. Now, that created a five-year penalty. Okay? But my mother's in good health. She's 79. She's in good health. And uh, so, and, and whenever she needed money, she didn't have to put it all in, by the way, but whatever she didn't put in would be at risk when she got sick. And my father was an overbearing Italian, and my mother barely knew how to write a check, okay? So uh, my, my uh, uh, you know, my mother was delighted to have my sister and I take over her finances, so she put all her money in, and she needed about $20,000 a year over and above her Social Security to live, so whenever she would need money, instead of me giving her $1,500 a month, it was too much of a pain in the neck, Whenever she would need money, I'd give her a check for 20000 would last her a year, give or take a month or two one way or the other. Everything went great for 11 years until she turned 90. Okay? Now she turns 90, she gets macular degeneration, blind in one eye and the other eye going. And at 90, blind in one eye and the other eye going, she's still driving on the parkway back and forth from Tom's River. And in one month, she gets into two low-speed car accidents. No, but it gets hurt, but lots of property damage. So I go down to see her, I said, Ma, I said, you can't drive anymore. I said, you're going to kill yourself. You're going to kill somebody else. I said, I hate to say this, but I've got to take your keys. And she was very reluctant, but she gave me her keys. She said, I'll give you the keys. She goes, but I want you to know I cannot live here anymore. Uh, uh, you know, it's independent living. There's no public transportation. I can't live here anymore. I can't go to the stores. I can't go to the doctor. I said, don't worry. I'll take care of it. I found a very nice assisted living that was only a mile away from my sister. Now, my sister's five years older than me, adores my mother, and is retired. And my mother's only a mile away, it's still walking three miles every day. So on a nice day, my mother could walk over to my sister's house, kill the day. On a not so nice day, my sister would pick her up, they'd go get their nails done, they'd get their hair done, they go to lunch, they go to the movies. It worked out great. The only thing that wasn't great is that the assisted living cost $5,700 a month. And that was 15 years ago. So I'm sure it's quite a bit more now, okay? But because I had done this more than five years prior, I did 11 years prior, I was able to get my mother on Medicaid Medicaid, not Medicare. And instead of paying $5,700 a month, we only paid $700 a month. I say $5,000 a month, that's $60,000 a year. This went on for nine years. I say $540,000. Would have wiped her out. She only had a half a million. And my sister and I signed an agreement when we did this that if we took any money out of mom's trust while mom's alive, we're only going to spend it on mom. We furnished her apartment. We got a big screen TV. We got her $8,500 hearing aids. We bought all her clothes. We sent her on vacations. 11 weeks before she died, she fell out of bed. Uh, she didn't break any bones, but she was very frail. We, uh, we hired a live-in to toilet her, bathe her, feed her, dress her, be her companion. It cost us 1000 a week. We did not go through an agency. We put an ad there's a, in a Polish newspaper in Garfield, a lot of Polish immigrants there. We put one out by um, Coney Island, a lot of Russian immigrants there. And we put one in Craigslist. And we got about 80 applications. And we only looked at people who could prove that they had taken care of people for at least uh, two to three years and had excellent uh, uh, references. And we hired one of them. And, uh, and it cost us 1000 a week. She took two days off a month. And my sister took care of all the, the payments. So I don't know what happened with the taxes and stuff. I don't want to know. Uh, but, uh, I just have a question. That's quite a distance, the Coney Island to where you Well, she lived there. That's the whole oh. point. The, it, it get, it's cheap if you get people don't have driver's licenses, just came here, and they're looking for a place to live, food to eat, place to sleep, and they're going to take care of mom. I have one client. He paid $800 a week. The, the woman gave her, 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 his father pedicure, manicure, uh, uh, his father was a stroke victim and uh, was paralyzed. Uh, haircuts, shaves, uh, did all the housework, did all the food cooking, went down the store, bought all the, uh, bought all the, uh, uh, the groceries, would give him the, the uh, receipts, he'd pay for the groceries. $800 a week, you know. So with the irrevocable living trust, yeah. you're saying that whoever you're speaking as the So we were the trustees and we were the beneficiaries. So when my mother needed money, I had to take it out of the trust and give it to my, I gave it to my sister. And why did I give it to my sister? 
first of all, the trust prohibitor gave to my mother. So I had to give it to either to myself or to my sister. Now, now part of that 20000 that I gave my sister, my sister has to pay income tax on. I would say probably three or 4000 on average. And my sister's in the minimum tax bracket. She's retired. I'm in a maximum tax bracket. So if somebody's got to pay income tax, I want somebody who's in the lowest bracket. So I'd give it to her. At the end of the year, her account would tell us how much incremental amount of income tax she had to pay because of it. And I would reimburse her from the trust. And, and, and so she wasn't out of pocket. So you could use her money to yeah. pay her. Yeah. It's not locked up in there. See, and not only that, when you apply for Medicaid, when you apply for Medicaid, they can say, oh, my God, what a wonderful daughter. Family. Look at She's paying all this stuff. Wonderful. Your mother's a utility bill. Could you pay the utility bills plus you're still My mother was in assisted living, no utility bills. When did you do the irrevocable trust? We did the irrevocable trust when she was seventy nine, she was living down Tom's River. When she was living yeah. by herself. Yeah. Yeah. So we gave her money and she paid her utilities, she paid she paid, she paid the maintenance, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. So you right. could still give her the money. You could give her the money, yeah. Anybody else have any questions? Because uh, I'm kind of running out of time. One, I guess. That you can tap the money that's in an irrevocable trust as being the beneficiary. Can I what? You tapped the money. I could steal it all. I could have stolen it all. My mother had to trust in me. The other thing I want to tell you is you can do anything with the, with the, with the trust. Um, you can invest in stocks, bonds, buy properties, real estate, anything. You can put a house in the trust. Well, the nice thing about putting a house in the trust is that you still get that half a million dollar capital gain if the house gets sold before mom dies. A lot of lawyers like to give mom a life estate and give you what's called the remainder. What's a life estate? It's the right to live in it for the rest of her life. You can't throw her out. They're afraid they're going to get sued for malpractice for if, if, if you throw her out. But if you sell that house before mom dies, big, big tax problems. Okay, So you can put it into a, an intentionally defective grantor trust. If mom sells it while she's alive, and she, her husband's still around. If they qualify, they could still get the half a million dollar capital gains exclusion. Otherwise, if she's single, she can get a $250,000 capital gains exclusion. If she doesn't sell it till she passes, you'll still get the step up in cost basis. That's one kind of a flavor of intentionally defective trust. Another, and you don't get that if you give it to kids. Okay? The other, the other flavor is, is for stocks and bonds. You put those in there. As long as they're there when mom dies, you get the step up in cost basis. And so we want to put... We want to have two different kinds because the reporting, we don't want any information to bleed back onto mom's tax return. Why? Because 20 years from now, there's only a five-year look back, but 20 years from now we go apply for Medicaid, they want to see mom's five years of tax return. So that's the tax return from year 15 to year 20. And they say, wait a minute, you know, mom could deduct the property taxes under the IRS rules for this trust that she puts her house so she could still do it. But, you know, I always tell the clients, there's a point, you know, where hogs become pigs and pigs get slaughtered. And I said, you know, you don't want anything leaning back because 20 years from now, we go to Medicaid, we give them the tax returns. Go, wait a minute, you said mom doesn't own any real estate. Why is she taking a property tax deduction? Now we got to show them the, 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 uh, uh, the tax return, okay? And, uh, and they, they don't know what to do with them. They kick them down to Trenton. I've had people, I've had clients waiting a year, 18 months before Trenton okays the trust, you know, but you have this hold up. So I tell them, do not take the tax deduction. Plus, a single person now, I think you get a $27,000 standard deduction anyway, so, and you can only deduct $10,000 anyway of, of property taxes. So, so it's not a big deal, you know. And, uh, and so that's kind of it. Anybody else have any questions? No, there's no minimum or maximum. The only thing is it has to file, depending on the kind of trust, it may have to file an income tax return every year. And you probably, if you have an account duty, it's probably going to cost you $800 to $1,200 to file it. So you don't want to put, you know, $10,000 in one of them. Plus, you've there got to pay us no. to do it. Okay. Yes. All right. I'm going to speak very personally, if you don't mind. I'm 71 years old. I'm retired. Yeah, I'm straight. I want you to know I'm straight. No. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Right. I'm single. Right. I'm 71. Right. I'm 74. Are, we, are you saying I should put everything into a irrevocable trust now? You cannot put your retirement benefits in unless you pull them out and pay all the income tax on it. But yes, I'm saying you should do it five years before you get sick. And most people don't want to do it because they don't want to give up 
control to the knucklehead kids. That's the big, that's the thing that holds them all back. Okay. <laughs> am I right or am I wrong? <laughs> okay. The answer is, here's what I want to tell you. It's our office policy. If you guys want to come in and see me, our office policy is the first visit is for free. Okay, you have my, my, my handout. It has my name, address, phone number on there. If you call my office, they will set you up, usually with a phone conference or a Zoom for the first meeting, okay? I have an office in Boston, too, and I spend time up there. But I can see you via phone or Zoom, no matter where I am. One of the nice things about COVID is I can practice law now pretty much anywhere on the planet. And, and I'd be more than happy to, to talk to you for nothing. What we do is the hours for free. I get some personal information from you. I give you some recommendations as to what I think you should, you should do. We do most of these things, I would say 98% of these things on a flat fee basis. I would then prepare a, a, a written fee agreement telling you exactly what we're gonna do, exactly what it's gonna cost, give it to you. There's no obligation, you don't have to do anything. You wanna do it, you sign it, you send it back with a check and we get going. If not, it was nice meeting you. Okay? All right, so listen, thank you for coming, and uh, you all better wake up now. Well, you were snoozing there, I thought.